So, you know, when I grew up, I had a lot of misconceptions about life through childhood and through medical training. And one of the misconceptions I had was about what an unhealthy workplace looks like. During my summer trips to Calcutta, India, I'd see these rickshaw pullers running barefoot on the streets. They had poor hygiene, unsanitary conditions. They had no access to health care. To me, that was like the unhealthiest workplace you could possibly be in. And then I come to Silicon Valley after medical training, and I start seeing patients that work in billion-dollar companies. They've got unlimited access to world-class medical care, yet they are overwhelming my offices with all kinds of chronic health conditions, from diabetes to heart disease to autoimmune disorders. Then I basically go through medical training, and I learn about the concept of heart disease. And with heart disease, basically what we end up seeing is that my vision of heart disease was essentially people that got heart attacks were older people that smoked, ate red meat, and then I come into my practice and I start seeing young folks, 20s, 30s, coming in with heart disease. Many, many of them have never touched red meat, many of them never touched a cigarette. It was completely different than what I'd learned about in medical school. So the other thing that I had misconceptions about was liver disease. So when I went to medical school, I learned that liver disease predominantly happened in patients that drank alcohol for decades. And unfortunately, I started seeing liver disease in my clinic and those at the age of 20 and 30. I talked to pediatricians in my practice and they were seeing fatty liver disease in kids that were seven or eight years old. With liver disease, typically we think of people consuming or abusing alcohol for decades. And with kids, we were finding out that there were certain elements of their diet that were significantly contributing to fatty liver disease. So what's going on here? There's actually a metabolic crisis, a traffic problem. When you are actually consuming carbohydrates, ideally you want the carbohydrates to go to a particular destination. You want it to go to your muscle. So you see uh, carbohydrates represented by a car up on the screen, and there's three major parking lots. There's your muscle, there's your fat, and then there's your liver. And ideally, you want the carbohydrates to drive the muscle so your muscle can burn it for energy. The way the carbohydrates get inside the muscle is by using a parking pass called insulin. Insulin's a hormone that allows the carbohydrates to go to your muscle. When you were young and you could eat pizza and not gain weight, most of that pizza was going to your muscle so you could burn it for energy. But when you become insulin resistant, the carbohydrates are trying to get inside the muscle, but they can't get in. The muscle is not responding to insulin anymore. So then the carbohydrate car gets rerouted. It starts going to your fat cells, and that's how we become fat and we gain body fat. It also goes to your liver, and your liver becomes filled with fat. The carbohydrates are actually converted to fat. So our young kids and young adults who've never drank alcohol, but are developing fatty liver disease, it's being converted by excess carbohydrates in the diet. The other thing your liver does is it takes those carbohydrates and makes dangerous cholesterol particles. So many of the patients I see in my clinic are not actually consuming much dietary fat. It's coming for an, from an abundance of excess carbohydrates in the diet. So the other misconception I had in medical school is that overweight patients looked overweight, that they had excess weight, excess body mass index, but the interesting thing I saw in my clinic is that many of my highest risk patients were very slender and skinny. On this slide, you're seeing two very famous obesity researchers. They're at an Indian wedding. The skinny Indian guy with the beard, he's probably a couple pounds lighter than the guy next to him. But when you look at his DEXA scan, the DEXA scan is actually an imaging study that looks for body fat. So the dark purple areas that you see on the screen, that's body fat. So the skinny Indian guy, the one whose mom's trying to get him to get fatter by overfeeding him, you know, spouse says you need to eat more food. He's actually got more than double the amount of body fat as the guy next to him. So where's that fat coming from? I'll tell you where it's coming from. Well, first of all, when you think about body fat, there's two types of body fat. And I'm showing you a jelly donut up there to sort of exhibit this. There's the outer subcutaneous body fat. That's the fat that's most visible to our human eye, the one that's belt, you know, sort of bulging and weighing over our waistline. That's the outer part of the donut. But inside is the jelly. 
The red jelly, that is our deep inner inflammatory visceral body fat. And that's the one that is linked to heart disease, cancer, and all types of chronic health conditions. Now this actually varies in different ethnic groups. If you look up at the slide next to the jelly donut, there's three major ethnic groups. You can look at the distribution of the donut to jelly. In Caucasians, on average, you basically tend to get a moderate amount of the donut part, the outer fat, moderate amount of jelly. In African Americans, you tend to see much more of that outer crust and less of the jelly, so more of the visible external fat. But look at the diagram for Asians. Asians actually have very less of that outer fat. That crust donut is much less. And that's why a lot of Asians, East Asians, Chinese, Indians, they come to my clinic, they look very slender. But they've got way more of that jelly. You see a ton of red in there. And that's the fat that's leading to a lot of that chronic heart disease, to liver disease, autoimmune conditions. So how can you tell how much of that jelly and how much of that donut you have? I mean, you can get body fat testing done. But you can also do some simple blood tests. If you get a standard cholesterol test done in your doctor's office, just look at something called the triglyceride to HDL ratio. Triglycerides measures the fat in your blood. HDL is your healthy cholesterol. Take the ratio, and that triglyceride to HDL ratio should be less than 3. The lower, the better. This ratio is going out of control in our patients. I talk to pediatricians. Four, five, six-year-old kids have ratios that are sky high. Adults have ratios that are sky high. And this ratio is actually a sign that you've got that metabolic traffic problem called insulin resistance. You're already developing heart disease. So a lot of our kids here in Silicon Valley are developing heart disease risk at the age of seven or eight because of the dietary and lifestyle choices they're making. The shocking part to me was in 2009, when I was lecturing at some of the biggest companies in the world on fitness, nutrition, exercise, I was doing everything right. I thought I was doing everything right. I was exercising five days a week, eating everything that the American Heart Association recommended. But take a look at my ratio. It's over 11, and I just told you it should be less than three. I was a ticking time bomb. And I was telling my patients to follow my advice, and a lot of them were ending up with the ratios that I had. So I had to completely rethink my approach to my own health and to the health of my patients. So. One thing I had to do was I knew I was exercising enough. I looked at my diet. I'm like, you know what? I'm not drinking Coke. I'm not eating pizzas. I'm not eating sugar. What the heck's going on here? Well, once I found out that I had a metabolic traffic problem, I realized that a lot of my disease is coming from eating too many healthy carbohydrates. And that's a problem that I'm seeing here in the community. A lot of my patients are shopping at Whole Foods. They're buying all the right brown foods but they're eating too much of it. And the thing is, if you've got a traffic problem, if you've got insulin resistance, yes, that oatmeal and banana that has 10 times as much carbohydrates than the eggs that we used to think caused more heart disease, that will get you into trouble. And that's what raised my ratio. I'm not saying you've got to ban that oatmeal and banana, but we need to personalize nutrition advice for every individual's metabolic circumstance. You can't just give the same handout to everybody. For a lot of my patients that have diabetes, they wake up with a high blood sugar. They eat oatmeal and a banana, and their sugar goes sky high for the rest of the day. If you don't have insulin resistance, you don't have diabetes, then the oatmeal and banana might be okay. We personalize devices and apps for each individual's personal preferences. We have to do the same thing for nutrition, because I've seen a lot of patients that follow standard guidelines, and they're getting worse. So really know about the ratio, and make sure you tailor your diet accordingly. So the other thing I want to talk about is food quality. So aside from just counting carbohydrates and looking at macronutrients, where is your food coming from? If you eat meat, if you're eating meats that are CAFO meats, CAFO stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. These are animals that are imprisoned indoors. They're force-fed grains that are laden with pesticides. They're deprived of sun. So when an animal is not exposed to sun, it cannot adequately make vitamin D. That's where we get most of our vitamin D is from sunlight. So when you eat animals that are deprived of sun, you're getting less vitamin D, you're getting less hormones and nutrients, and then these animals are injected with hormones and antibiotics. You know, when I was thinking about that, I also thought, you know, when I go out to these companies and I visit the cubicles and the workstations, a lot of us humans are no different than this cattle. <laughs> I call these chows, okay, community human office workers. A lot of students are like this as well, where we're holed up inside constantly. 
right? And on these floors at these workplaces or micro kitchens where people are being force fed or they're eating on their own, all these inflammatory foods, sugars. And you know, really our situation is not that different. But there is one key difference. Unlike the cows and the cattle in those CAFO facilities, each of us has a choice. We can choose what type of food to put in our body. We can choose to step away from the cubicle, go outdoors, walk in the sunlight, do deep breathing. The animals don't have that choice, but we do. I explained this to my kids, because my kids are dinosaur obsessed, and when I was telling about the food chain, I said that, you know what, if T-Rex was walking through Silicon Valley and was eating mainly engineers, he would be obese. <laughs> because we are like the CAFO cattle. We're vitamin D deficient, we're eating all these inflammatory grains and excess foods. So if T-Rex ate us, he would get those same types of conditions, arthritis. Okay? So thank God, you know, dinosaurs are gone because they'd be suffering a lot right now with chronic health conditions. And dinosaur insurance costs would be extremely high. Okay, so the other thing I want to say is as our modern environment is changing, as a doctor, we have to change our approach to how we evaluate patients. So in the clinic... You know, in medical training, I learned about vital signs. You got to check the blood pressure, the pulse, the temperature. But now I'm looking at what I call MDVs, modern day vital signs. I need to know how many steps my patients are walking. How many hours of sleep are they getting? We need to evaluate stress. What is the amount of carbohydrates? What type of nutrients are going into their body? Because if I don't evaluate those as a doctor, they're going to end up with chronic life-threatening conditions. And this is what medical training needs to do now. So the other thing I want you to realize is, you know, often I get patients come to my clinic and they're like, you know, how can you tell me to eat less rice and noodles? You know, my grandmother ate as much rice and noodles as she wanted and she lived to be 80, 85. Well, we got to step back a little bit, okay? Because if you're going to use a grandma excuse in me, I'm going to put this slide up and show you what the difference is, okay? So let's take back our rickshaw puller that I showed you. A rickshaw puller who's running down the streets of Calcutta on average is running about 40,000 steps. My average engineer is, because I measure their steps like a vital sign, walks 2,000 steps. That's 20 times less active. Our rickshaw pullers are carting around obese human beings in heavy freight, so they've got strong legs and core. Their muscles are active and hungry for carbohydrates. Our sedentary workers, they have no core. Their legs have no strength, so they don't have that demand for energy. Vitamin D comes from the sunshine, so somebody who's laboring outdoors or our ancestors or grandparents who used to be outdoors a lot more, their vitamin D levels were not deficient. And vitamin D is not just about bones. Vitamin D is an anti-inflammatory hormone. Vitamin D actually reduces insulin resistance. When your vitamin D levels are optimal, you have less of that metabolic traffic problem. So if you have all of those criteria, then yes, eating blindly as much carbohydrates as you want and starches is fine, okay? For a rickshaw puller, he can have three, four servings of rice a day, and he's not going to develop chronic health conditions. He's skinny. He needs protein in his diet. He can't afford it. But in that situation, it's OK. But we in this generation, with these modern risks, cannot be eating that same type of diet. So what I've done as a doctor now is instead of just giving lifestyle advice, one thing I tell my colleagues, too, is often one of the problems is we prescribe medications too quickly. To me, medications are a last-line defense when you fail to make lifestyle choices and changes. So if I cannot motivate you with the words, I'm going to use apps and devices to motivate you, okay? So now what I do in the clinic is I prescribe things like an activity monitor or maybe an app to get you to squat more so you can build up that leg strength or maybe a vitamin D app that will measure your vitamin D that you're getting when you're outdoors. Because these are things that we need to do. I can't tell my engineer to quit his job and become a rickshaw puller, right? That's not going to happen. But there is some middle ground. And often finding that middle ground is a difference between optimal health and chronic disease. So I plead to my colleagues and future doctors that we need to send more patients to the app store than the drug store. That we need to prescribe technology over pharmacology rather than just popping pills and prescribing pill after pill. So the other thing is work does not just have to take place in front of a computer in a seated position. You see me over uh, on the slide. I'm actually on an elliptical machine. I use a $10 bungee cord and basically strapped my laptop to my elliptical machine. And I wrote a book 
I wrote 80% of my book on an elliptical machine, okay, while my kids were near me. So my kids are playing. They work out with me. The other thing is we've got to set good examples for our kids. And a lot of teens out there, you've got to push your parents to move more. We've got to motivate each other and find innovative ways to be active while getting our work done. And believe me, I think I wrote my book much quicker because I was active while doing it. If I was seated, I probably would have nodded off. It would have taken me a lot longer. So you will be more productive and energetic if you can find ways to get your homework done, to get your you know, office work done while you're standing and while you're being active. Stress is a toxin. Okay, stress is a major, major toxin. I did not understand this in medical training. I have patients that have normal triglyceride to HDL ratios, blood sugar's normal, normal body weight. They are coming in with cancer, heart disease, and I have definitively known that it's linked to chronic stress because chronic stress causes increased immune activation and inflammation. So each of us has to be aware of stress, and if, you know, a lot of us know that we're overwhelmed, but you can use apps, tools, and devices to actually measure how your body's responding to stress. Download an app for heart rate and see where your heart rate level is. There's breathing apps that can give you biofeedback so you breathe more slowly in a regular fashion. There's apps that actually measure heart rate variability. HRV, know about HRV. HRV actually measures how active your parasympathetic system is, and that's the relaxation response. So there's apps and devices you can use that see if your breathing and heart rate are in rhythm, and if they're in sync, then you've got optimal HRV. So when you're aware of these signals that come from phones, you know, when you're aware of these body signals, you'll know that, listen, it's time for me to put the books aside, maybe do some deep breathing, maybe get outdoors and manage that stress. And having that skill and being able to respond to those signals will be a lifesaver for you. So one thing that I'm jealous about is when I go out to third world countries or I visit India, I kind of pay attention to people sleeping on the streets in awkward positions, on ledges, in these types of positions, and I'm jealous. Because I'm sleeping on a $1,000 mattress in a temperature and noise controlled room and often I struggle to sleep. If you optimize stress, if you control stress, if you're more physically active and you get adequate sunlight to maintain your biological clock and get that vitamin D, the greatest gift you get is deep, refreshing sleep. And that's something we need for optimal brain health. And keep in mind that when you're not sleeping properly, it causes a metabolic traffic wreck. Insulin resistance and diabetes can result independently just from sleep deficiency without any other lifestyle risks. So be sure you pay attention to that. So for me, making these changes was critical. As you can see, my ratio over the years after I made some of these food substitutions went from that scary 11 number down to less than two. And I'm doing this over and over with my patients by prescribing the right lifestyle changes, by prescribing devices and apps to help them do this. And I've also realized that as a physician, I want to really extend my impact. A lot of you out there that are thinking about going to medical school, the first thing I want you to think about is do you want to go to medical school? Do you want to become a doctor or are you doing it because you're being pressured to become a doctor? Make sure you love medicine if you're going to go into it because believe me, I have some colleagues that were pushed into it and they're going through depression. So this is a very serious decision you're going to be making. Second thing is keep in mind that because of media and because of our technology tools, we can extend our message outside of the walls of our exam clinic. So I use a blog, I use my book. We actually built a mobile clinic that goes out to 14 different high-tech companies. We're measuring those labs and triglyceride to HDL responses. We're actually getting people to change in their work sites. But the most impact I have is 10 minutes once a week, every week. And that's basically, I do a health radio show. I never thought I'd be doing a radio show, but it's a South Asian radio show. So basically for 45 minutes, they do Bollywood hits and entertainment and comedy. And while they have an engaged audience, I basically get on top of that show for 10 minutes and I talk about nutrition and exercise. And since I've been doing this for a few years, I've realized that that has had a much broader impact than anything else that I'm doing in the clinic. So really find those unique opportunities to make these types of changes and impact. So now you're looking at a picture. I can get a little bit carried away with these wearable devices sometimes. You can see an ear clip monitor. I've got um, you know, uh, an activity monitor on my wrist. Those funky glasses I'm wearing are amber colored glasses that actually filter out blue light so I can get 
better sleep at night because the blue light can interfere with melatonin being released. But you know, I have a lot of patients that are a little bit too addicted to these wearables. I had a patient come see me in the clinic who was doing so well, but then she gained 10 pounds and she told me, Dr. Sinha, I know why I gained 10 pounds, I stopped walking. And I was like, Nancy, why'd you stop walking? And she told me I stopped walking because I lost my Fitbit. And I was like, Nancy, you know the Fitbit is a device that measures how many steps you walk. It doesn't actually send an electrical charge to your legs and propel you forward. It's not a remote control. You're allowed to walk without the Fitbit device. <laughs> and so, I mean, the main point I want to make is next to my picture is my grandmother who lived in her mid-80s. The only wearable she had was her sari, her Indian dress, and her bangles. But she intuitively and instinctively knew what to do for her body. So on sunny days, she would bring the cutting board outside. She'd chop vegetables and prepare fish. She would squat on the ground and read the paper, sweep the floor, or eat off the floor. She was naturally doing a lot of things that she knew was good for her body. And we can actually do this too in our modern world. You can actually squat and read your tablet or your iPhone. You can have a low table, and actually, these things will actually improve leg strength, improve range of motion. Try to think of what your grandparents did. How can you mimic that in the real world? And most importantly, I want you to take time to take off the wearables and disconnect, because when you disconnect, that gives you the opportunity to reconnect with the most important wearable device you have, which is the human brain, and the most important apps you have, which are human instinct, human instinct, and inspiration. So please be sure you tap into these apps because they're really going to put you on the right path to optimal health, both physical and mental. Thank you.